2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, and chapter 12, verse 10, and 13 through 16. The wife of Uriah the Hittite heard that her husband was dead, so she mourned for her husband. When her mourning was completed, David sent for her and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. She gave birth to a son for him, but what David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then chapter 12, verse 10, we hear the judgment pronounced against David by the prophet Nathan. So now the sword will not depart from your house forever, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, The Lord himself has put away your sin, you will not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have treated the Lord with utter, utter contempt, the child that is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born for David, and the child became sick. David sought the Lord's mercy for the child. David fasted and spent the night lying on the ground. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly wrong. For before some people came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when those came, he drew back and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision group. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not acting according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, If you, a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believe in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves are also found to be sinners, then is Christ a servant of sin? Certainly not. In fact, if I build up again those things that I destroyed, I bring myself on myself the judgment of being a lawbreaker. Indeed, through the law I died to the law that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now am living in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not regard the grace of God as nothing, as a matter of fact, if righteousness is through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The Gospel for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost is Luke 7, 36 through 50. A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Just then a sinful woman from that town learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him near his feet, weeping, and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she began to wipe them with her hair, while also kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. 
When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say it. A certain money lender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the greater debt forgiven. Then he told him, You have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. Yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. Those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we can only humble ourselves before your throne of mercy and grace as we recognize our sinfulness to receive the forgiveness that you so freely give. So we pray that as we meditate in your word today, that you will speak again to us the law, reminding us of our sin, but that you will also speak to us of your mercy and grace and forgiveness. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we continue into our time uh, that we call the Sundays after Pentecost, and this time when we uh, focus on our Christian growth, we'll remember that we have been called to hear the Word and to know that the Word that comes to us through Christ is a Word of compassion. And so today we are confronted very directly with who we are and how it is that God calls us into fellowship with himself by reconciliation. So we're going to look then at two historical events and then see how we fit into those as God comes to us through Christ. We'll begin by looking at David. And then we'll look at this woman and Simon the Pharisee. And then we'll turn to our Galatians text and see what we can find there about us, about ourselves. The little piece that we read from 2 Samuel is just a piece of a larger story there, a larger event in his life, and an event that we would certainly call a dark moment life. As a matter of fact, it is mentioned in other places uh, in the history of the, of the people of Israel that David was a man after God's own heart and that subsequent kings in his line, at least those who were righteous, who followed the ways of the Lord, did so except in 
the case of David and the wife of Uriah. It was a dark moment. And to read this story makes one even feel the darkness of it. And so we remember that David was tempted, he lusted, and he brought Bathsheba to his bed. And then, in order to cover up his sin, he tried to get Uriah, Bathsheba's wife, to go to her. But Uriah was a soldier, and he knew that they were at war, and that he ought to have been out on the battlefield with his soldiers, with the rest of the soldiers. And so he did not go to his wife. So David then, in order to cover up his sin, had Uriah killed in battle. Demanded that the commander of the army place Uriah in the most dangerous part of the battle, ensuring that he would be killed. So that's the context here that we find when we read our account from 2 Samuel chapter 11. That Bathsheba recognized, found out that her husband indeed was dead, that she mourned, and that David then brought her to his home and made her his wife, after which the prophet Nathan came to David and confronted him with what he had done. David tried to cover it up, but God knew his sin. And God spoke the law to David and reminded David of his sin and of the consequences of his sin. And David was broken. And David fell before the Lord and we read the confession that he wrote. Psalm 51. As he laid himself bare before the Lord, acknowledged his sin, and pleaded for God to forgive him. And so then we also have, in the account that we read, this in uh, chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, the words that Nathan spoke to David. There would still be consequences, and we need to remember that there are consequences that continue on when we sin. And yet, as we see the example of David, when he confessed his sin, God forgave him. And we hear that declaration through the, the mouth of David, Nathan, to David, that his sin was forgiven. A similar story, I suppose, uh, although very different, uh, but it is a story of forgiveness that we read in our Gospel text today. Jesus, having been invited to the home of a Pharisee, and we have then two characters that Luke writes about here, besides Jesus, obviously he is the main character in this account, but we have this Pharisee named Simon, and we have this woman who having heard that Jesus was at Simon's house, also took the liberty to go there and have this encounter with Jesus. So we're at the home of a Pharisee, and we remember that in the grand scope of things, prior to the crucifixion and resurrection, the Pharisees were, were threatened, we might say, by the popularity that Jesus was gaining. And in that also uh, a, a waning of the influence that the Pharisees had among the people of Israel. And Jesus had some powerful things to say as he spoke law to the Pharisees, calling them to repentance. So we then contrast how Simon treated his guest to how this woman treated Simon's guest. As Luke records the account, he tells us, just then a sinful woman from the town, learned that Jesus was reclining at the Pharisee's house. 
Later we see Simon reacting, believing that Jesus should have scolded her and accusing Jesus of not being a prophet because he didn't know who this woman was. And he also accuses her of being a sinful woman. But what we find in their actions is key to the outcome of this event. Three things that were hospitality practices that Simon did not do. And from the story, I, I believe that we can rightly imply that not only did Simon not do them, but that he deliberately did not do them in a show of disrespect to Jesus. It was customary that when you received guests, you had their feet, you washed their feet. You had your servants wash their feet, or at the minimum, you provided water for your servants to wash their feet. Now remember, this is first century Palestine, first century Israel. We're not wearing shoes and socks. We're sandal-footed, or maybe even barefooted. And we're walking in streets that are not paved. We're walking in dirty, dusty streets. And so when we come in, and we're not sitting at a table, we're lying down, resting our body on our elbow with our feet behind the back of the person next to us. And so one of the primary customs then was to wash feet of our guests. Another primary custom, a show of hospitality, would, to, would, would to be to greet the guests with a kiss. And then also to provide oil that they would pour over their heads, or put on their hair, I suppose, to, you know, to bring it back into a presentable state after having been out walking in the dirty streets. And none of these three things did Simon do. And yet the woman did, but on a very different scale. And so Jesus then says to Simon, you didn't provide water to wash my feet. And look, this woman, she's been crying on my feet and wetting them with her tears and drying them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, and yet she's been kissing my feet. You did not provide oil for the anointing of my head. And look at her. She's anointed my feet with this costly perfume. And then he asks Simon a question, or presents to him actually a little parable about a money lender who had de two debtors, one who owed 500 days' wages and one who owed 50 days' wages. Neither one of them could pay their debt, so the money lender forgave them. And the question then comes up to Simon, which of the two debtors is going to love the money lender more? And Simon's reply is, well, I suppose the one who had the greater debt forgiven. And so then Jesus applies that to the woman and to Simon. That the woman was sorry for her sin, for her great sin, and so she received great forgiveness and showed great love as a result of that. And then the implication that Simon, in his self-righteousness, was not willing to confess, confess his sin and receive forgiveness, and so his show was of little love. But the core of the story is to understand the forgiveness that Jesus so freely gave to the woman. He did not forgive her because she cried on his feet. He did not forgive her because she wiped his feet with her hair and kissed his feet. He did not forgive her because she anointed his feet. He forgave her because she came in faith. And we see the last words that he spoke to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
So we might say that both David and the woman understood their sinfulness, came to the source who could forgive, and in faith received forgiveness. How does this work? What is actually happening in order for that to happen, and how does this apply to us? We go to Galatians chapter 2, and I want us to look specifically at verses 19 and 20. Verse 19 we read, Indeed, through the law I died to the law that I might live for God. And so we have the law that speaks to us about our sin. The law that reminds us that we are so prone to put anything in our lives in priority above God and His Word. When we say that we are putting God in priority, we have to remember that God comes to us through His Word and speaks His Word to us, and He has standards that He expects us to meet. And we begin most succinctly, specifically focused, that we are to love the Lord our God with everything we are, our whole heart, soul, and mind, and then love our neighbors as ourselves. If we want to expand that, we have the Ten Commandments. And we ought to be constantly reminding ourselves of those commandments and the standard that God has set for us and as we read the commandments and as we meditate in the commandments and think about them, we recognize that we don't fulfill them. And as a matter of fact, we can't. Yeah, we might be able to obey one or the other at certain levels, but ultimately, if we break one, we break them all. And the first one is the hardest one. Because we put other things in front of God. We want to live our lives how we want to live them and not how God wants us to live them. And so we don't study His Word and apply it in our lives. And the law speaks to us and shows us our sin just as the law was spoken to Nathan through the prophet David and just as in some way the sinful woman being reminded that she was sinful had the law spoken to her, and Simon also. So the law comes to us, reminding us of our sinfulness and of our need for a Savior. And so then we turn to verse 20 of Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And here's the application. Crucifixion. The crucifixion of Christ. That because of our sin, we deserve to be eternally separated from God. We call that eternal death. And there's nothing we can do to change that. And so Christ, Jesus, died the death we deserve. So when we say that we have been crucified with Christ, we begin with the fact that Christ was crucified and died, and that we are invited to participate in that crucifixion. So that our old nature is put to death, and this happens in baptism, and it happens as we receive the gift of faith, as we hear the word and put our confidence in what Jesus has done for us, so that our old nature dies. I no longer live. My old nature is put to death, and instead a new nature, which is filled with Christ, comes to life. And we receive forgiveness of sins, and we are reconciled to God, and we are given a new life now, and a new life that will continue for eternity. And as we wait for that eternity to come, we then live in this new life, as we read in the second part of verse 20, the life I now 
am living, the life I am now living in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So yes, we recognize that we continue to live on in this world. Our bodies continue to function and live on in this world. But that now, who we are and our sinful desires need to be put away, put aside. And instead of following what we want, according to our sinful natures, that instead we live by faith, putting our full confidence in Jesus, the Son of God, remembering that what He did, He did because He loves us and gave himself for us. David heard the law, repented of his sin and received forgiveness. The sinful woman was reminded of her sin. She repented of her sin and received forgiveness. The law also comes to us. We need to hear it that we would receive the forgiveness of sin and be reconciled to God. Lord Jesus, we can only give you thanks for your love and your mercy. You loved us and gave yourself for us, dying the death we deserve, forgiving our sins graciously, So grant that we would love you. And as we live out our lives here, live for you. We ask in your precious name.